Okay, guys, so today we're going to talk about lower extremity injuries. Um, this is part of um, surgery one, so for traumatology slash orthopedics. Okay, so starting with hip fractures. So let's start with the mechanism of injury. So if, for instance, we have a relatively young patient, um, most of the time the mechanism of injury is like a major trauma, like a motor vehicle accident that involves like a high impact collision fracturing the hip. Um, for old or older patients, for instance, um, maybe this can be attributed to like, like certain bone pathologies like osteoporosis or they have osteoporosis and they fell. Um, so more like low impact injuries. Um, also, um, old patients can be involved in motor vehicle accidents as well. Yeah, you're right. So high impact can also be a mechanism of injury for hip fractures in older patients. So we have different types of um, hip fractures depending on where exactly the fracture is. So if you look at this, um, this image here, we have like the different parts of the femurs. We have the femoral head, the femoral neck, the greater trochanter, the lesser trochanter, the sub um, trochanteric area, sorry, just checking the spelling, and the intertrochanteric area, so the area in between. Um, I don't want you to remember all of this because um, I just want you to remember the most common types. So the most common ones, you could have like intertrochanteric fractures, trochanteric fra fractures, but the most common one is the femoral neck fracture. So it's the fracture of the, femor the femoral neck. So right here in this area. And um, this is very important to remember because it can lead to a vascular necrosis. So that's um, the death of the bone due to the insufficient um, blood supply. So um, in terms of physical examination, the things that you're gonna see if someone comes in with a hip fracture is that the affected limb um, the affected femur would be shortened and externally rotated. So this is not like 100% correct, but most of the time um, with hip fractures, the patient is going to present with a shortened externally rotated um, leg on the affected femur. So I want you to remember this because this is very different from hip dislocation. So this is like if we're trying to exclude differentials, for instance, we know that the problem is in the hip. Is it a hip fracture or is it a hip dislocation? So, as I said, most like more commonly than not, with hip fractures, the leg would be sh the affected leg <laughs> would be shortened and externally rotated, and with the hip dislocations, actually it would be shortened and internally rotated. So the way I remember this is. Um, I look at the words fracture and dislocation. So with fracture, it doesn't have um, an I as a vowel. Um, it has an E at the end, and that reminds me of external rotation, so externally rotated. With dislocation, the word dislocation um, has an I as a vowel, but doesn't have an E. So that reminds me that with hip dislocations, I'm looking for an internally rotated leg. So that's just a simple way and like how I remember things. Okay, so how do we diagnose? So it's very um, kind of intuitive. Obviously, we're going to do an x-ray. <laughs> For treatment, um, it's going to be surgical. Um, so with surgical, we're going to do ORIF, so open reduction internal fixation. So open reduction means that the surgeon would use an incision um, to access the bone and kind of realign the fragments so they heal properly. Um, internal fixation refers to kind of like piecing the bone fragments together with some sort of hardware like pins, like plates, rods, screws, or a combination of these. And I would actually do another video on the different types of fixation in a later date. But this is everything about hip fractures. Okay, so moving on with hip dislocation. So um, the mechanism of injury would be large force trauma, like again, a motor vehicle accident or pedestrians being hit by cars or so collision accidents. Um, also high impact sports like football and gymnastics. So again, um, there's two types of hip dislocation. There's posterior hip dislocation and anterior hip dislocation. And actually posterior hip dislocation is the most common one. It happens in about 80 to 90% of the cases. 
So um, with posterior hip dislocation, what you're going to see is a shortened internally rotated leg. Okay, for anterior hip dislocations, it can be externally rotated, but because posterior hip dislocations happens 80 to 90 percent of hip dislocations, I would just remember that in terms of um, like in, in physical examination, what you're going to look for is a shortened internally rotated leg for hip dislocations, okay, as opposed to fractures, which would be shortened and externally rotated leg. So um, in terms of um, a diagnosis, again, you could do um, an x-ray. And for treatment, we can have, um, well, it needs urgent immobilization, so reduction. So immobilization with a splint or a sling, um, it's urgent because the longer you leave the dislocation, there's a higher risk for complications like a vascular necrosis. So again, that's the death of the bone because of insufficient blood supply. Um, if the joint um, cannot be placed in position or if, it's, if there's like damage to blood vessels or nerves um, or ligaments, then surgery may be an option as well. Okay, so the next one is slip cap or slip capital femoral epiphysis, which is a heck of a name, so I just say slip cap. Um, so with slip capital femoral epiphysis, basically this is a weakness in the proximal femoral growth plate that leads to the displacement of the femoral epiphysis. Basically, what this means is that the femoral head here is slipping off or sliding off the femoral neck. <laughs> so it kind of looks like an ice cream slipping off a cone. So this is the um, femoral head and this is the femoral neck. So it's kind of the, the, it looks like this is the ice cream and this is the cone and the ice cream is slipping off the cone. Um, risk factors include obesity. This is more common in males than females. Not exactly sure what the ratio is. Um, and in terms of like peak age of presentation, so uh, typically it's around 12 years of age in girls and around 13 to 14 years um, in boys because um, this is related to um, you know puberty. Um, the, the bone growth related to puberty. Um, so symptoms include painful limp. So this is very important to remember, painful limp, altered gait, and they can present with isolated thigh or knee pain as well. And this is because of the involvement of the medial obturator nerve, which runs along the medial thigh from the knee to the hip. Not necessarily important, but just remember the main thing is um, a painful limp, okay? Because we're going to compare this to leg calve, which is the next um, injury. Um, and the presentation for leg calve is a painless limp, okay? So for a slip cap, painful limp, altered gait, and sometimes isolated knee or thigh pain, okay? So diagnosis, again, we're going to do an x-ray, and we're going to see this classic kind of ice cream slipping of a cone image, okay? Um, in terms of treatment, so, um, well, firstly, the patient needs to be non-weight bearing straight away. So once they, you know, once this slip cap happens, they get that painful limp, they need to be non-weight bearing straight away. And then we refer them to like an orthopedic surgeon and the orthopedic surgeon would typically, um, perform like, we'll put pins, this is called surgical pinning. It they would put pins there to kind of put them back together. Okay, so surgical pinning, this is the gold standard treatment for slip cap. Um, so here we have a single cannulated screw placed in the middle of the epiphysis to connect that um, slipping um, femoral neck back to the femoral head, okay? So again, gold standard is surgical pinning for treatment. <laughs> Okay, so the next one is leg calve. So leg calve is the idiopathic osteonecrosis of the hip. So um, the peak incidence is much younger compared to the peak incidence of slip cap. Um, so with slip cap, remember that the peak incidence for females, for girls is 12 years of age, and for boys, it will be around 13 to 14 years of age. For leg calve, it, it's around five to eight years um, of age. Um, that's the peak incidence. And it has a one to four male to female ratio. So again, that's another difference because slip cap is more common in males, but um, leg calve is more common in females. Um, 
that's not very important though. The more the most important thing is the difference in symptoms. So leg cove presents with a painless limp. So I put this um I, I don't know what you call this asterisk <laughs> there because um it's it okay. It may not totally be painless for the patient. So the patient may experience mild pain, some mild discomfort, but in general, slip cap is really painful. And leg cove may be just discomfort, maybe just mild pain. But I'm gonna put painless limb just so um, you remember. Okay. So with leg cove, it has like an insidious onset, so it would probably just start with little to no um, pain, maybe just hip stiffness um, and then loss of the internal rotation, which can then progress to like more significant discomfort, usually after activity activities. But again, um, the pain is quite mild, whereas in slip cap, um, the pain is quite severe. OK, so um, we can order an x-ray to help us diagnose this. So here we can see the um, deformity in the femoral head here. It's kind of flat. We see the flattening of the femoral head and the widening of the joint space here. Um, so um, this actually, this shows the necrosis, um, the osteonecrosis of the, um, the femoral head, okay? So in terms of treatment, um, it's observation. It, again, this is another difference compared to slip cap because slip cap, as you remember, the gold standard is actually a surgical treatment. It's surgical pinning. But with leg calve, it's only observation. So the patient would be told, um, uh, will be prescribed a non-weight bearing physical therapy. And 67% of cases, they heal spontaneously. And surgery is only reserved for those obviously who didn't um, recover after this uh, physical therapy. And if the patients are a lot older than eight years of age. So younger patients um, don't typically benefit from surgery. So in the next slide, we're going to compare leg calve and um, slip cap. Okay, so let's compare slip cap with leg calve. So um, the peak age of presentation, like I said, with slip cap, it will be around 12 years of age for girls and 13 to 14 years of age for boys. For leg calve, it's much younger, around five to eight years of age in terms of peak age of presentation. And symptoms, probably the most important thing to remember here, is that in slip cap, they would have a painful limp. With leg calve, they would have a painless limp painless. <laughs> Could be mild discomfort, mild pain, but this is how I remember it. So with um, the way I remember this is with leg calve, the L reminds me of painless, painless leg calve. With slip cap, femoral epiphysis, the femoral bit has an F and painful has an F. So that's how I remember it. So leg calve with an L, painless limp, Slip cap, um, femoral epiphysis, the femoral bit has an F, painful limp, okay? Treatment, again, gold standard for slip cap is surgical pinning. With leg calve, it's just observation um, physiotherapy, non-weight bearing physiotherapy. So these are the, um, the differences, okay? All right, so moving on to Oscar Schlatter disease. So with Oscar Schlatter disease, this is basically an injury caused by repetitive strain and chronic avulsion of the apophysis of the tibial tubercle. Um, so basically this is more common um, in the age of 13 to 14 years old, especially in boys during their growth spread. So um, why does this happen? So in this kind of um, age group in boys who are 13 to 14 years of age, they're, even in girls actually, their um, tibial tuberosity, so where the patellar tendon attaches to, hasn't completely ossified yet. So it's weaker and therefore in kids who are constantly like active, jumping, running, kicking, um, the ligament is constantly pulling on that attachment site of the tibial tubercle which causes like the separation of the patellar tendon from the tibial tubercle 
and that separation causes some sort of trauma and inflammation and therefore callus formation. And this callus formation is, um, would be represented as this pronounced kind of lump there um, during x-ray and in palpation. So symptoms of Osgood Schlatter disease would be anterior knee pain, so front of the knee pain that is worsened or exacerbated by some sort of activity like jumping, kicking, running, squatting. Um, so in terms of physical examination, we are going to see and palpate this pronounced tender um, tibial tubercle. Also on the x-ray, we can see this, um, this formation of that kind of lump, okay? So in terms of treatment, this is a self-limiting disease. So when that growth plate ossifies completely, the pain is going to go away completely. So um, the treatment therefore is very conservative, just rest, eyes, physical therapy, um, NSAIDs if they need. So um, the way I remember things I need to remember for Osgood Schlatter disease is I say Osgood squatter disease. So it's kind of like playing with the rhyme, okay? Osgood Schlatter disease, Osgood squatter disease. So Osgood reminds me of Osgood Schlatter disease, obviously. Squatter because the pain is exacerbated by squatting or any sort of activity like running, kicking, playing sports. Um, the knees, because um, this is a problem with the knees involving the patellar ligament, the tibial tubercle, instead of like involving the hip in the case of slip cap or leg cove, for instance, okay? Um, because, you know, 13, 14 years um, for boys, again, kind of like the same age group for slip cap, um, but slip cap is a problem with the hip and Osgood, I was going to say squatter, Osgood Schlatter disease is a problem with the knees, okay? Okay, so moving on to um, like knee ligament injuries. So starting with ACL tears. So an ACL tear is the most common knee ligament injury. Um, and in terms of causes, so we can have a non-contact cause and a contact or direct contact cause. So the most common cause is a non-contact cause, which is due to like a pivoting, a twisting injury. So for instance, um, we have someone who is jumping or running and then suddenly stops and changes direction. They pivot, they twist, and that puts like a dynamic valgus stress on the knee. Um, which can tear the ACL. So um, when you're evaluating for an ACL tear, pay attention to the history that the patient gives you. So typically they would feel like a pop in the knee followed by swelling. So this acute swelling is due to hemorrhosis that happens directly right after they tear their ACL. So it's a pop and a swell, a pop and a swell. So in terms of um, physical examination, the test that you're going to do is called the Lachman test. Lachman test, how do I remember that Lachman test is for ACL? Because the first three letters of Lachman, when you actually re rearrange those letters, it spells ACL. It doesn't sp spell PCL, it doesn't spell MCL, it doesn't spell LCL. It only spells ACL. The first three letters of Lachman, if you rearrange it, it's ACL. So this is a test for ACL tears, okay? Not for any other um, knee ligaments, okay? So how do we actually do the Lachman test? So the Lachman test we do, the patient is lying supine. You use both hands. You use one hand to fixate or to stabilize the femur. So imagine this, the legs, the femur, this is like the, the lower leg, like the tibia. So with my one hand, I am fixating or stabilizing the femur. With my other hand, this hand lower, I grasp the lower leg and I bring the tibia kind of in slight external rotation. And what I do is I try to translate the tibia anteriorly. So I try to pull it towards me, translating it anteriorly. So a positive result would be if the anterior translation of the tibia is equal or greater than 3 mm compared to the uninjured leg. So if it moves forwards, moves anteriorly, translate, uh, translates anteriorly greater than or equal to 3 mm compared to the uninjured leg, then this 
um, is a positive um, Lachman test, which suggests suggests an ACL tear. Okay, so what do we do to confirm this? What imaging studies are we gonna perform? I'm actually glad you said X-rays. Okay, we use X-rays not to diagnose ACL tears. X-rays are not for diagnostic um, purposes because X-rays, what do, what do you use X-rays for? It's only to rule out fracture. It's only to rule out a fracture somewhere in the knee. Okay, why do we not use X-rays as a diagnostic tool for ACL tears? Because X-rays do not show soft tissue damage. X-rays they just don't show any damage in the tendon or the ligament or on any other soft tissues. They're only done to exclude fractures. Okay, so the one that we're going to do actually is an MRI. So MRIs, they can create images of both soft and hard tissues, and they can um, like support the diagnosis of an ACL tear, and they can also show us the, ex the extent of the ACL injury and other um, soft tissue injuries if present. So um, it's not on this slide, but I just want to mention that MRI is actually very important because it will show, like I said, the severity of the ACL injury because we, we can grade um, ligament injuries. Okay, so ligament tears are usually graded from the scale of like one to three. So grade one is like an incomplete tear. So there's, um, the patient is going to complain of very minimal like pain. <laughs> so it can be painful with like pressure or like on palpation, um, but the pain is usually not too severe. Um, grade two tear, it's still an incomplete tear, but it's kind of a moderate tear and there would be pain and swelling, okay? Grade three, like ligament tear is a complete tear. So there's significant swelling, there's significant pain and also, alongside that, there's going to be knee instability. So th they're going to feel that their knee is kind of giving out. Okay, so um, an MRI can help us kind of grade the severity of this ACL injury that we're dealing with. Right. In terms of treatment, how do we treat? So obviously, in an acute scenario, you know, after the pop and swell, we're going to go to rice first so rest um, um, ice compression elevation okay and then um, so there's there's two routes to this if so we can have conservative treatment and surgical treatment so um, conservative treatment usually is just physio rehabilitation and this is usually for older or inactive patients Surgical repair um, is reserved for like, surgical repair means ACL reconstruction. So we're gonna reconstruct the ACL. So that's generally reserved for like grade three tears. So if it's completely torn, then we need to obviously reconstruct the ACL. And also for young um, people or like for athletes who wish to return to their sports, especially if their sports involves a lot of jumping, pivoting, they need their they need their ACL to be functioning, okay? <laughs> so um, and even after that surgical that repair that ACL reconstruction, they still need to go to rehabilitation to physiotherapy, okay? So recap for treatment acutely: rise, rest, eyes, compression, elevation. Um, for older inactive patient, can just be conservative. So that's physiotherapy, um, rehab, um, surgical repair is ACL reconstruction. Um, reserved for like grade three um, tears or for like athletes who want to continue with their sports that involves a lot of jumping or pivoting. Okay, so moving on to PCL tears. So um, actually the posterior cruciate ligament, um, like an isolated injury in the posterior cruciate ligament is very rare. <laughs> Um, so usually it's seen in combination with other like knee ligament injuries, so like with an ACL injury, for example. But anyhow, um, the mechanism of injury for PCL tears um, is usually due to, again, um, high energy trauma, like a motor vehicle accident. 
Um, so like if there's a direct blow to the proximal tibia when the knee is flexed. So think about your classic dashboard injuries. Um, so um, in terms of physical exam, the, thing that, the test that you're going to perform is called the posterior drawer test. So the posterior drawer test, again, the patient's going to lie supine. You're going to flex the hip at the hip at 45 degrees and then the knee around about 90 degrees and you um, fixate the position by slightly like sitting on the patient's foot <laughs> and then you palpate the joint line here and then you push the tibia you push the tibia posteriorly in like an explosive movement okay and the positive um, posterior drawer test is when this affected tibia um, translate posteriorly more than six millimeters okay so um, the imaging again we're gonna do an MRI to confirm that it's a PCL tear um, and then x-rays just to rule out any fractures so in terms of treatment um, so acutely after obviously like an injury um, you would perform rice, so rest, um, ice, compression, and elevation. And um, a lot of the times, actually, people are going to be fine without treatment. So um, they did a study in, like, I think American football players. Um, they did, like, random MRIs, and they saw that most of them are still playing even with a, like, grade 1 PCL tear. So normally people are going to be fine so there's again two options here so we have conservative treatment so just you know rest NSAIDs physiotherapy or rehab or like putting a knee brace on just to help stabilize the knee a little bit um, or surgical so surgical is obviously PCL reconstruction again reserved for grade 3 tears or for those with like grade 2 PCL tears um, but like they can't stabilize the knee or um, they want to play again um, or like if someone has multiple injuries um, if they have a PCL tear an ACL tear um, and maybe even MCL or LCL tear that causes significant knee instability so that needs surgical treatment or if they don't respond to non-surgical treatments they can also be candidates for surgical treatment. So to summarize, um, treatment in an acute setting would be RISE, and then there's two routes, conservative, such as rest, NSAIDs, physiotherapy, knee brace, or surgical, which is PCL reconstruction, generally reserved for patients with grade three um, PCL tear, so complete tear of the PCL, or multiple ligament um, tears, so if they've torn PCL, ACL, and other ligaments. Um, grade 2 is causing like a lot of knee instability that has not responded to non-surgical treatments. Those um, can be done surgically. Right, moving on to MCL tears. So MCL tears are caused by valgus stress or force to the lateral aspect of the knee. Okay, so um, in terms of like um, physical exam, the test that you're going to perform is called the post, uh, the valgus stress test, okay? So if that's positive, it's indicative of an MCL test. What is a valgus stress test? How do you perform it? So patient is lying supine, um, legs are fully extended. With one hand, you grab on like the lower leg, just above the ankle on the medial side. And with your other hand, you fixate the femur. So you stabilize it from the lateral side. And then with your... Um, hand that's holding the, um, the, 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 the lower leg, you slightly externally rotate the tibia and you perform a passive abduction in the knee. So that passive abduction in the knee is causing, um, is putting a valgus stress on the MCL. Okay. So um, the positive result for this is you're going to feel um, excessive gapping on the medial side of the knee and you're going to reproduce the pain that they feel um, when they put um, valgus stress on the knee. So um, also on physical exam 
if you palpate the MCL on the medial side, um, they can get pain directly over the ligament. So when you palpate, you can even see swelling as well, depending on the, the severity. If it's a complete tear, obviously it's going to be significant swelling and pain. Um, grade one, not much pain. Grade two, you know, slightly more pain and more um, swelling. So treatment, um, again, depends on the severity or the grade of the MCL tear. In the acute setting, perform RISE, again. Um, and then uh, conservative usually is the go-to because most often surgery is not necessary unless it's a grade three tear or other ligaments are involved. Okay, so conservative includes um, so conservative treatment include like NSAIDs, physiotherapy, and like bracing. So that's it for MCL tears. Oh, I forgot. So this is the way I remember. <laughs> I remember valgus stress test. So valgus stress test for MCL because um, I just say mucho gusto. Mucho gusto, um, Spanish. Um, kind of kind of translates to nice to meet you i mean it i know it doesn't but like um we say it to say nice to meet you okay well that's what i got taught in school anyway so mucho gusto nice to meet you mucho m for mcl tear gusto because of valgus stress so valgus Mucho gusto, nice to meet you. I'm not sure how much sense that made, but <laughs> this is the way I remember MCL tears. Mucho gusto, mucho M M C L. The gusto bit valgus. So valgus stress test is for MCL tears. LCL tear again very rare to be seen as an isolated injury, um, but it can be caused by sudden virus force to the medial aspect of the knee. Um, so, how do we, what do we do in a physical exam to test for LCL tear? So, LCL um, would be the virus stress test. Remember that MCL, mucho gusto, 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 valgus. So, LCL means it's the virus stress test. Okay. So, how do you perform a virus stress test? So, patient is again lying supine. It's very uh, similar to um, the val va valgus stress test. So with virus stress test, patient is lying supine, both legs um, extended. So with the leg that you're testing, you put one hand and grasp the leg just above the ankle joint, but on the lateral side. And with the other hand, you fixate um, the femur on the medial side. And then with the bottom hand, the hand that's holding the um the tibia what you do is you passively adduct the leg in the knee joint and that's gonna put a virus stress on the knee on the lcl so a positive result for this test is excessive gapping on the lateral side of the knee joint and the reproduction of pain also on physical exam, you can palpate the um, lateral side of the knee for the LCL. Um, if it's painful um, or if you see swelling in there, then that may point towards an LCL tear. Um, so with treatment uh, in the acute setting, obviously rice, and then again, two routes, we have conservative or surgical, conservative NSAIDs, um, rest, bracing, um, physiotherapy, rehabilitation, surgery reserved for grade three tears, complete tearing of the um, LCL, or if other um, ligaments are involved. Okay, so moving on to meniscal injury. So um, acute meniscal tears are most often caused by like twisting or rotating um, of the knee. So um, patients would say that they felt a pop, lock, and drop. So pop, lock, and drop is for meniscal injury. Pop and swell is for ACL. Pop, lock, and drop, meniscal injury. Pop and swell, ACL. So pop, lock, and drop. Why pop, lock, and... It's like a tongue twister. Pop, lock, and drop. Pop because they felt a pop in the knee. 
and then it locks into place which means that they cannot fully extend the knee and drop because the knee just gives away so they heard a pop and then um they there's a it locks because they cannot fully extend the knee and then it just gives away it drops so pop lock and drop so in terms of a uh, physical exam we're gonna palpate the joint line because you know there's the medial and the lateral meniscus so we can we need to palpate the medial and lateral aspect um so we palpate the joint line for any tenderness we look at that for any swelling as well um so if there's tenderness in the joint line then that's that may suggest meniscal injury um we can also perform the mcmurray test so the McMurray test is a test for meniscal tears. McMurray test is a test for meniscal tears. How do I remember this? McMurray test is a test for meniscal tears. Meniscal kind of sounds like men is called, right? Meniscal, men is called. McMurray test, Murray. Murray is a man's name. So men is called Murray. It doesn't make sense grammatically, but just hear the words. It's going to help you. Meniscal tear equals McMurray test. Men is called Murray. Murray is a guy's name. Men is called Murray. So, meniscal sounds like men is called. Murray reminds me of McMurray test. So, what test do I use for meniscal tears? The McMurray test, okay? I don't know how much sense that made, but just keep saying it in your head. It's going to make sense. So McMurray test for meniscal tears because men is cool, Murray. Anyway, <laughs> hopefully that helps you. If it doesn't, just forget about it. But just remember McMurray test for meniscal injury, meniscal tears, okay? So how do you perform the McMurray test? So the patient lies in a supine position like so, and then the knee is kind of fully flexed we grasp the ankle with one hand and then with the other hand we palpate the joint line and then we bring the knee so the knee here is in flexion so we bring the knee into extension so we kind of like pull um with with this and then back to um so we bring it to extension then back to flexion and then we repeat the extension and flexion movement while we're doing that we feel with this hand for any um painful popping or clicking in the knee okay so we have to palpate both the the medial and the lateral side because obviously there's medial and lateral meniscus um in terms of imaging x-rays we use just to again exclude fractures or like arthritis um mri is gonna show us um any problems with the meniscus okay because it's um I, I, like i said x-rays are not used or they're very limited in terms of showing any soft tissue damage, right? So um, in terms of treatment, again, um, rise, rest, eyes, compression, elevation, and typically it's conservative, just NSAIDs, uh, physio rehab. I actually have a meniscal injury. So my right knee, um, it's the, I think it's both, <laughs> I think it's both the lateral and medial um side mainly because i also have an mcl injury here that's probably why the medial aspect is hurting but like definitely my lateral meniscus has something going on so i feel this pop lock sensation so it, it pops and then it locks i can't bring it to full extension and then i feel like my knee is just gonna give away but then it got better with um <laughs> like a few months of physiotherapy and i'm back to my weightlifting now. So definitely conservative treatment helps <laughs> with meniscal injuries. Okay, so moving on to knee dislocations or more um, accurately called tibiofemoral dislocations. So um, with knee dislocations, this is a true surgical emergency. Um, because it's usually accompanied by like arterial or nerve injuries as well. So nerve nerves that are commonly involved are the perineal and the tibial nerves. And the artery that's involved, it's usually the popliteal artery. So um, how, how does this happen? So the mechanism of injury for tibiofemoral dislocations are typically high energy traumas like motor vehicle accidents, falls from really high elevation, or even um, through sporting injuries.
So um, how do we diagnose? So we can do an x-ray. So an x-ray would actually help us identify the type of tibiofemoral dislocation as well. There's a couple of types. So the most common ones are anterior and posterior tibiofemoral dislocation. So image A, if you see here, that's the patella. This is the femur, that's the tibia. This is an anterior um, tibiofemoral dislocation because the tibia is pushed forwards, okay, past the femur. Whereas B, this is the patella, this is the femur, this is the tibia. If you see the tibia is pushed backwards, so this is a posterior posterior um, dislocation, posterior tibiofemoral dislocation. So we have anterior and posterior. We can also have um, rotary, medial, and lateral, but those are less common. So just remember, anterior, the, the tibia or the shin bone is pushed forwards past the femur, and for posterior tibiofemoral dislocation, the tibia is pushed backwards um, behind the femur. Um, we also need to evaluate um, um, the, the artery, okay? So we need to conduct vascular evaluation. And the way that we do that is we're going to assess, so we're going to palpate the distal and popliteal pulses. So we try to feel if the popliteal pulse is still there, palpate um, the arteries distal to that, because obviously if the artery is distal to that, um, you don't feel a pulse or the pulse is weak, then it indicates that there could be a damage in the popliteal artery. If you want to do like a more um, um, like an actual investigation instead of just palpation, you can measure the ankle brachial index. So um, ankle brachial index of less than or equal to 0 0.9 is very sensitive for um, a vascular injury. It's very sensitive, it can indicate some sort of ischemia in the leg, um, pointing towards vascular compromise, like potentially, you know, um, the involvement of popliteal artery. Um, another one, so um, this is actually probably going to be the most sensitive, is a CT angiography. That's going to show you if um, there's problems with the popliteal artery, okay? So you could palpate the popliteal artery and the distal pulses. You could do an ankle brachial index. If it's less than or equal to 0 0.9, then that suggests some sort of ischemia or vascular injury. Um, you can also do a CT angio just to triple check. <laughs> um, so with, I told you this is a surgical emergency because there's a high rate of neurovascular injury. So injuries to the perineal and the tibial nerves but more um, kind of scary than that is the potential popliteal artery injury. Because if the popliteal artery injury is not recognized, or if there's like a delay in treatment for more than eight hours, then the patient may require amputation of the leg because of the distal limb ischemia that they're going to experience. So just remember with tibiofemoral dislocations, the main complication is um, amputation. And this is because if the popliteal artery injury is not recognized or not treated within that eight hour period, then there is a higher risk for distal limb ischemia, which may require amputation. So in terms of treatment, obviously, if, um, <laughs> if there's to be femoral dislocation, we need immediate reduction. We need to like, at least, you know, reduce the gap between those at least try to put them back together. And then um, obviously ortho consult, and we may even need help, um, we, we even contact um, vascular surgeons just for vascular repair if there's damage with the popliteal artery. And then again, the orthopedic surgeons would do some ligament reconstruction. Um, if, cause here, look, this is probably gonna be I mean, you can't really see on an x-ray if there's damage with the ligament, but it's kind of really obvious here. If it's, if the tibia has been displaced by that much, there's going to be <laughs> definite ligament um, ruptures there. So again, for treatment, immediate reduction, just try to put them back together, reduce the gap between the bones, and then um, contact um, orthopedic surgeons, you know, for ligament repair and maybe vascular surgeons as well, if popliteal artery is involved. Okay, the next one is patellofemoral syndrome. So patellofemoral syndrome is essentially an overuse disorder. So um, with patellofemoral syndrome, the patient would complain of like um, anterior knee pain. So pain 
um, kind of around or behind the patella. So I actually have this as well. So like I said, I have um, MCL problems and meniscal problems as well. And I also have patellofemoral syndrome. My knees are just not very good. <laughs> so patellofemoral syndrome, risk factors include women and runners. So this is actually um, co like colloquially called as like runner's knee or even jumper's knee because um, those who are at risk are typically runners or like people who do lots of jumping um, as their sport or like a hobby or something. And basically it, it wears the, <laughs> the patella out, okay? So um, what they will complain of typically, this is what I feel, is like a popping or like a cracking sound in the knee, especially like when I'm standing up or like when I'm squatting or like when I'm jumping, things like that. So um, how do we diagnose? So the main um, way is it's diagnosed clinically. So the doctor's gonna ask, you know, where do you feel pain? Obviously it's gonna be on the anterior aspect of the knee, like around the patellar region or behind the patella. And what exacerbates the pain? So typically some sort of activity related to squatting, to jumping, kneeling down, you know, bending your knees and then um, standing up from a bent or kneeling down position. Um, that's what I experience anyway. Um, so after that, we can do x-rays just to rule out fractures. And um, we can order an MRI as well if it doesn't improve over time, just to evaluate um, whether or not there are some like soft tissue injuries involved as well, if there's any tendons or ligaments involved um, or like problems with the meniscus, things like that. Um, basically, we're just trying to rule out other stuff that it can potentially be apart from patellofemoral syndrome. So by the way, the way I remember the things I need to remember for patellofemoral syndrome is I say instead of patellofemoral syndrome, I say patellofemoral run. Okay. It kind of like, again, this is a play with like how the words sound. So patellofemoral, patellofemoral run, patellofemoral, patellofemoral run syndrome. And that reminds me of the common risk factors, which includes female and running or any sports related to running, jumping, squatting, kneeling down, bending down, things like that. Um, in terms of treatment, um, usually it's just conservative treatment. So, you know, rise, rest, eyes, compression, elevation, your um, painkillers, NSAIDs, physiotherapy, um, which is what I had. I had um, like physio and rehab for a couple of months. And um, you can also have orthotics. These are basically just shoe inserts that help you align um, and stabilize your foot and your ankle. So it takes the stress off the patella. Okay. So this is all you need to know for um, patellofemoral syndrome. Okay, moving on to iliotibial band syndrome. So iliotibial band syndrome, similar to patellofemoral um, syndrome, is an overuse injury. Um, and the risk factors are kind of like the same as well. Like this presents with runners, cyclists, um, people who do repetitive knee flexion and extension. So like running and cycling. Um, the only difference really with patellofemoral syndrome and iliotibial band syndrome is the location of the pain. So um, basically, because of the overuse of the lateral uh, knee, the pain is going to be like in the lateral femoral epicondyle, like there. That's the location of the pain, lateral um, uh, femoral epicondyle, instead of being on the anterior um, aspect of the knee around the patella. Okay. So this happens because of the friction between the iliotibial band and the lateral epicondyle of the femur. So that's why the pain is there. It's that irritation in that area. Um, Diagnosis again made clinically. You can palpate, and there, if they if they have tenderness in the lateral knee, then that's suggestive of an iliotibial band syndrome instead of um, you know patellofemoral syndrome. Um, in terms of treatment, again, it's conservative NSAIDs, rest, physiotherapy, um, things like that. <laughs> Okay, so moving on um, to ankle sprain. So um, there's different types of ankle sprain. 
Um, so there's eversion ankle sprain, or this is this eversion ankle sprain. You evert the knee, and then you get an eversion ankle sprain. <laughs> it's also called the medial ankle sprain. The second one is inversion ankle sprain. So you invert the ankle, and then you injure the lateral side. So this is called um, the lateral ankle sprain or inver inversion ankle sprain. Out of the two, inversion ankle sprains are the more uh, more like most common okay so inversion and aversion so inversion ankle sprain or lateral ankle sprain is the most common out of the two and with inversion ankle sprains the ligament that's more um that's like most commonly involved or the most common one to be injured is the anterior talofibular ligament okay the anterior talofibular ligament it's here that's the one that um is more commonly torn in inversion ankle sprains. So how do I remember this? So anterior talofibular ligament is the most common ligament in the ankle to be injured for inversion ankle sprains, that is. Um, anterior talofibular ligament. So anterior A, talo, T, fibular, F, A, T, F, always tears first. A for always, T for tears, F for first. So the ATF ligament, anterior talofibular ligament, always tears first. Okay, so that's how I remember it. Um, in terms of diagnosis, usually just by, um, I can't speak anymore, usually just by physical examination. So there's going to be um, swelling, there's going to be pain when you palpate the lateral aspect. Um, of the ankle if it's an inversion sprain. If it's eversion, obviously you're going to see an, um, swelling and pain in the medial aspect of the ankle. Okay, So usually it's done clinically just by physical exam. Um, X-rays can be done to rule out any fractures, but typically not necessary. I'm sure you've sprained your ankle once or even more times in your lifetime like I have. Like I've sprained my ankle so many times from literally walking in high heels from playing badminton from from playing sports just running you know it just happens happens um so we have these um otawa ankle rules they're called um these are actually most of these are common sense but th these rules are very sensitive for excluding um ankle fractures and it determines if we need to perform an x-ray of the ankle or not, okay? So, in the rules, it says that if the patient is unable, unable to bear weight um, immediately after the injury and take like four steps um, in the office bearing weight, or office means like, you know, in the hospital, in the clinic where they're being evaluated, plus there's a tenderness at the posterior edge or tip of the lateral or medial malleolus, you need an x-ray okay so again it's common sense obviously if the patient isn't able to bear weight immediately after the injury or you know carry their weight and walk four steps when they're being evaluated in the office and if there's tenderness at the posterior edge or the tip of the lateral or the medial malleolus then you need an ankle x-ray just to check for fractures uh, if if none of these um, rules are met, then it's probably just a sprain. So treatment, the treatments for a sprain, you probably know this because I'm sure you've injured, you've sprained your ankle. It's so, so common um, and it can easily be done. <laughs> it's the RICE therapy. So rest, ice, compression, elevation, and NSAIDs for pain. Um, also maybe immobilization as well, just to let it heal for a bit, but rarely surgical at all, okay? Okay, moving on to Achilles tendon rupture. So um, some of the risk, obviously Achilles tendon rupture is just the rupture of the Achilles tendon, which is, it's like here, okay? So um, risk factors include um, fluoroquinolones. So fluoroquinolones are broad spectrum antibiotics usually used for the treatment of like respiratory or like urinary tract infections. Um, they increase the risk for Achilles tendon rupture, but this is very, very rare. It's like 12 out of 100,000 when they did a study. Um, so it's not very common in real life, but it doesn't mean it's not a common exam question. 
So fluoroquinolones just associate this with increased risk of Achilles tendon rupture, but honestly, not very common in real life. Um, other risk factors include stop and go sports like tennis, basketball, football. Um, on physical examination, um, the patient, actually, actually, history first. When you're taking history from the patient, they would say that they felt a pop followed by a severe pain in the posterior ankle. So a pop and severe pain in the posterior ankle where like, the Achilles tendon is basically. So on physical exam, obviously when you palpate that area, it's going to generate some pain. Also, you can do the Thompson test. So the Thompson test is the test for Achilles tendon rupture. Um, Thompson test, Achilles tendon rupture. So the Thompson test, it involves the patient lying um, prone. So they're like on their tummy with their feet kind of hanging off the table. And what you do is you squeeze the gastrocnemius muscle or your calf muscle, and you look for plantar flexion. And the absence of plantar flexion is positive for a rupture, okay? So patient lies prone, feet hang off the table, you squeeze the gastrocnemius muscle, and you watch for that plantar flexion. If that plantar flexion is absent, it's indicative um, of, a, of an Achilles tendon rupture. So how do we treat? So there's two options, non-surgical, which involves just splinting, and surgical. So you surgical repair, which means you actually repair the ruptured tendon. Again, it depends on the extent of the rupture of the tendon. The next one is plantar fas fasciitis. So with plantar fasciitis, um, this is, again, just an overuse injury, so chronic overuse um, that leads to micro tears and inflammation in the origin of the plantar fascia. So the pain would be um, here in the heel. So um, the patients would complain of um, heel pain in that area that's worse during their first steps in the morning or like um, after some time, like after some period of inactivity and then they start walking again, the pain is um, worse during those kind of situations. That's, um, th that kind of points towards plantar fasciitis. So how do we diagnose? Most of the diagnosis is done just clinically. We ask the patient, you know, where's the pain? Um, what makes the pain worse? When is the pain worse? Things like that. Um, and typically, you'd be able to diagnose plantar fasciitis. You could do an x-ray just to rule out um, calcaneal stress fracture, so fractures in the heel bone. Um, but honestly, sometimes you don't even need that. Um, in terms of treatment, it's conservative, so NSAIDs, painkillers, you know, stretching exercises and like silicone inserts just to alleviate some of the pressure from the um, plantar fascia. Um, so that's it. <laughs> okay, so moving on to interdigital or Morton's neuroma. So don't be scared. It sounds like a tumor, neuroma, but it's not actually a tumor. It's just the thickening of the tissue that surrounds the digital nerve. So um, this is essentially just a compressive neuropathy of the interdigital nerve that leads to plantar forefoot pain, okay? So again, not a tumor, it's just the thickening of the tissue that surrounds this interdigital nerve right there. So risk factors include um, women, it's five times more common in women, and those people who wear tight fitting shoes and high heels, which are more commonly than not women. So the pain is between the third and the fourth um, metatarsals of, sorry, the pain is between the metatarsals of the third and the fourth toe. So this, these are your metatarsals, right? So between the third and the fourth metatarsal of the third and fourth toe. So the pain is there. Um, how do we, okay, symptoms, burning pain in the third intermetatarsal space, like I said, between the third and the fourth um, uh, metatarsals of the third and fourth toe. Um, so the pain is described as burning. So the diagnosis is typically made clinically. So the patient would say, oh, I feel burning sensation between my third and fourth um, metatarsal. And um, the way I remember this, by the way, is Morton's neuroma. That M, if you tilt it sideways, it looks kind of like a three. So it reminds me that the pain is in the third intermetatarsal space. Third intermetatarsal space, okay? Third M3, third intermetatarsal space, so between the third and fourth um, metatarsals. 
And if you tilt it again, it would be W. So it's more common in women. Okay, so it, third intermediate space, more commonly in women. Um, the diagnosis as well can be done via um, like a physical exam. It's a test called web space compression. So we take the foot of the patient and we compress the metatarsals together. So we compress the, the median lateral um, sides. We squeeze the metatarsals together. Um, and the positive result for this test is the, rep the reproduction of the characteristic burning pain that they feel in the third intermetatarsal space. Okay, In terms of treatment, conservative NSAIDs, and you can um, ask the patient to wear more like wide fitting shoes because you know um, it's gonna be worse if it's tight fitting or use like um, shoes with metatarsal pads again to alleviate the pressure um, to minimize the pain. Okay, so moving on to Jones fracture. So Jones fracture is the fracture of the fifth metatarsal um, kind of around the proximal diaphysis. So how do I remember that Jones fracture is the fracture of the fifth metatarsal? So Jones has five letters, J-O-N-E-S, five letters, fifth metatarsal um, stress fracture. Okay, so Jones fracture, Jones has five letters. <laughs> you can't really see me, five letters. And it's the stress fracture of the fifth metatarsal. Okay, so we it's it's in the proximal diaphysis, I told you. There's also pseudo Jones. So pseudo Jones is just like Jones. Um, it's the fracture of the fifth metatarsal as well, but it's kind of um, more proximal. It's like at the base or the tuberosity of the metatarsal. So if Jones fracture is here, so the Jones fracture fracture would be more proximal. So again, um, Jones fracture is here, uh, uh, like around the proximal diaphysis, and pseudo Jones would be more proximal. It would be around the base or the tuberosity of the metatarsal, the fifth metatarsal. So how do we, um, how do I remember that as well? So pseudo so Jones, you know, five letters, fifth metatarsal stress fracture. Pseudo Jones also has Jones, so five fifth metatarsal, but pseudo P, that P in pseudo reminds me that it's more proximal. So P for proximal. It's more proximal than Jones fracture. Okay. So diagnosis, we do an x-ray. Um, it's going to show us the stress fracture. Um, treatment, it's conservative, just um, NSAIDs. Okay. Okay. This is the last one. So Lis Frank or your tarsal metatarsal injury. So this is a a, an injury where the metatarsal bones are displaced from the tarsus. So what is the tarsus? So the tarsus is this. The tarsus is the midfoot and the hind, hind foot together. So I think it's actually a cluster of seven articulating bones. So basically it's just the midfoot and the hind foot combined. And what this frank injury is, it's the displacement of the metatarsal bones from the tarsus. So in terms of diagnosis, we need to conduct an x-ray. Um, and a lot of times, actually, this is missed on an x-ray because you don't really see a fracture. You just see like a widening um, between uh, the, the, this metatarsal and that tarsus. So um, on the x-ray, the FLEC sign is pathognomonic for a Lis Frank injury. The FLEC sign. What is the FLEC sign? The FLEC sign is an avulsion fracture at the origin or insertion point of the Lis Frank ligament. So the Lis Frank ligament is here. Can you see that? This. So the avulsion fracture of that ligament means that this is going to separate from this. It's going to look like this. Okay. So here we're going to see that this metatarsal is kind of sliding away or being displaced from the tarsus. This is the flex sign, okay? The flex sign involves the Lis Frank ligament. That's why it's called the Lis Frank injury. Um, in terms of treatment, conservative treatment includes immobilization with a cast, um, but um, surgery is needed if the emo if this conservative treatment doesn't work because if it's not treated properly, it can lead to long-term complications like osteoarthritis um, in the Lis Frank joint around there. So it can cause long-term problems. So just to summarize, Lis Frank um, 
injury is when the metatarsal bones are being displaced from the tarsus, usually involving the Lisfranc frank ligament. It's an avulsion fracture at the origin of the Lisfranc frank ligament. And um, we first try with conservative treatment, like mobilization with a cast. If that doesn't work, it needs to heal properly. So we do surgical treatment because if it doesn't heal properly, it can lead to um, osteoarthritis at, at the Lisfranc frank joint. Okay, so let's go through some questions to test how much we've learned. Right, question one. A 27-year-old male presents to the office with pain and swelling of his left knee. He was playing football. He stopped short to change directions and felt a pop in his left knee followed by pain and swelling. Pop and swell. A Luffman test is performed which demonstrates increased anterior translation of the tibia compared to the uninjured leg with no distinct endpoint. What type of injury did this patient likely sustain? So here we have a pop and swell, and remember that's indicative of an ACL tear because they would typically hear a pop, and um, it's going to be followed by hemothrosis, you know, um, leading to the acute swelling. Also, they did the Lachman test. Remember Lachman, L-A-C. If you rearrange the first three letters, it's ACL. So this is test for ACL tears, and it demonstrates increased anterior translation. So remember that the positive um, Lachman um, test means that if the um, tibia translates anteriorly more than 3 mm compared to the uninjured leg, that's positive and indicative of an ACL tear. So the type of injury is ACL tear. How do we treat? So we treat again um, in the acute setting, rise, rest, ice compression, elevation, and then um, conservative treatment for um, elderly people or like relatively inactive people, but for younger people, for athletes who are wishing to return to their sport, they would need surgical intervention. Also, if the ACL tear is grade three, which means it's a complete rupture of the ACL, then they would need um, surgical treatment as well. Okay, so question two. A 14-year-old boy presents to the office complaining of anterior knee pain. He states the pain is more severe when he plays basketball or squats down. On examination, you note a pronounced standard tibial tubercle. Um, tubercle. <laughs> what is the mainstay treatment for the likely diagnosis in the patient? So first of all, what is the likely diagnosis in this patient? So we have a 14-year-old boy um, and he complains of anterior knee pain and it increases in severity when he plays basketball or when he squats down. And on examination, we note a pronounced tender tibial tubercle. So um, based on this um, history, we can deduce that this is actually an Osgood Schlatter disease, okay? Remember Osgood Squatter Denise, Osgood Schlatter disease. Osgood reminds me of Osgood Squatter disease. Squatter because um, the pain becomes worse with activity like squatting, running, kicking, things like that. The knee because it involves the knee, the tibial um, tuberosity, the patellar um, region. So um, what, and also the age fits the demographic. So um, the peak age presentation is around nine to 14 years of age, because that's when they usually go through a growth spur. Um, and remember that Osgood Schlatter disease is just the repetitive strain and chronic avulsion of the apophysis of the tibial tubercle. So that's why there's like inflammation and like callus formation why we feel that um, lump, that more pronounced um, um, tender um, tibial tubercle. So what is the mainstay treatment for this? Um, for Oscar Schlatter, it's a self-limiting disease. So typically it goes away when the tibial tuberosity finally ossifies. So it's just conservative treatment like NSAIDs, rest, um, like physical therapy, things like that. Okay, what is the most um, common ligament to be injured in an ankle sprain? So you know, remember we have two types of ankle sprains, inversion ankle sprain or your lateral um, ankle sprain and eversion ankle sprain or your medial ankle sprain. Out of those, the most common one is inversion ankle sprain. And an inversion ankle sprain, the most common ligament to be um, torn, to be involved is the ATF ligament, the anterior talofibular ligament. ATF always tears first anterior talofibular ligament. Um, how do we treat? Basically just conservative um, NSAIDs. Um, we can try to mobilize the ankle for a bit. Um, rest, ice, 
things like that, okay? Okay, which test is performed as part of the physical exam in a suspected Achilles tendon rupture that involves squeezing the gastrocnemius muscle and watching for the plantar flexion of the foot? So um, this is called the Thompson test. So the Thompson test is performed when we suspect Achilles tendon rupture. So this involves the patient lying prone with their feet kind of like sticking out, dangling off the table, and then we squeeze their gastrocnemius muscle, their calf muscle, and we watch for that plantar flexion. In the absence of that plantar flexion, is indicative of an Achilles tendon rupture. So how do we treat an Achilles tendon rupture? So we treat an Achilles tendon rupture, um, we start with conservative management, so like splinting, immobilization. If that doesn't work, or if the rupture is really severe, like if it's a complete rupture, then um, we need surgery. Okay, last question. A 35, sorry, a 31 year old male was playing football with his friends when one of his friends landed on the lateral aspect of his right knee in an attempt to tackle him. He immediately felt a tearing sensation which was followed by severe pain. A valgus stress test is performed which displays pain and laxity approximately 30 degrees of flexion. What, what structure of the knee did the patient likely injure? So here we have a patient who experienced like um, um, a force hitting the lateral aspect of his knee and they did a valgus stress test and it displayed pain and laxity um, when they did the test. So basically when they did the valgus stress test, there was excessive gapping and reproduction of pain. So positive valgus stress test is a test for MCL. How do I remember that? Remember mucho gusto? Mucho, M reminds me of MCL, gusto, valgus, because the knees are like coming together. Mucho gusto means nice to meet you, so they're coming together. M for mucho, which also stands for MCL. Gusto, valgus, which is a valgus force, which means that the force like pushes the knees together. Um, so this is um, an injury of the MCL or the medial collateral ligament.